uniform circular motion. A body executes a circular path at constant speed. The speed is constant, but we know it's accelerating because the velocity changes direction. And acceleration is equal to the rate of change of velocity, but velocity is a vector. We take a look at the moon executing a circular path around the Earth at constant speed, or close enough. There's a force of gravity in between them, mutually attracting. And so we know this must be accelerating in that direction. If it weren't moving, the moon would accelerate directly into the Earth and hit the Earth. But it is moving. It's still falling. It's still accelerating into the Earth. But this force of gravity accelerates it into a circular path. If it weren't for the force of gravity between these two, directed radially inward on the moon, it would just continue in a uniform straight path at constant velocity. However, it is this force of gravity that pulls it into a circle. So we look at, for instance, your book. To me, erroneously declares a centripetal force which is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, while many people use this term, I'm asking you to never use it in this class. Why? Because students mix it up. They say something is moving in a circle, so there's centripetal force and they're done. No, no, no. So you say the moon is moving in a circle, so it has centripetal acceleration. Oh, what force is acting on it? Centripetal force. Well, how about we just get rid of the Earth? And then the moon goes around in a circle, right? No. It will move in a uniform straight line. So it's not centripetal force in this situation. It's the force of gravity. How about you see a car is driving around in a circle? What force is acting on it in order to make it go in a circle? You say centripetal force? Well, no. How about in this section, it travels over a frictionless patch of ice. You know exactly what's going to happen. The car is just going to keep going in a straight line. In fact, when you look at a car from the side, you can see, oh, the tires are bent under the force of friction between the tires and the road. And so there's a force in this direction. Centripetal force? No. It's the force of friction. So the force of friction in this situation is equal to mass times acceleration. If you see something accelerating in a straight line, like a car or a bike taking off, You don't say, oh, that's a linear force. You say, oh, wow, it's accelerating. I wonder what force is producing that acceleration. So you look, it's a force of friction or it's a normal force of something pushing it. Likewise, when you see something moving in a circle, its velocity is not constant, so you know there's some acceleration. There's centripetal acceleration if it's moving in a circle. You say, ah, acceleration. There must be some force acting on it. I wonder what it is. It could be tension in a string pulling it inward. It could be the force of friction. It could be a number of forces. In fact, you'd have to say the vector sum of the forces provides a net force which gives you this acceleration. So please don't use that term, centripetal force. There is no centripetal force. Force is an attraction or a push between two objects. It's an interaction between two objects that affects each in opposite directions. So let's take a look at an object that is accelerating centripetally and find out what that acceleration is equal to. We take, for instance, the moon going around the Earth. We know that the centripetal acceleration must be directed inward because the only force acting on that moon is directed inward. And in fact, the word centripetal means center-seeking. So you'll notice whenever something is executing uniform circular motion, it's being accelerated inward, the net sum of the forces must be inward. So I want to derive the expression for centripetal acceleration. What exactly is the acceleration of something moving at speed v in a uniform circular motion of radius r? We simply need to find the change in velocity and the amount of time it takes. First of all, we need to compare two velocities that have changed only by a little bit. Why is that? We know if we wait one full revolution, the initial velocity is identical to the final velocity, and the average acceleration is zero. Why? Because it's accelerating in this direction now, this direction now, this direction now, this direction now, and so of course, the average velocity is zero, and the average change in velocity, if you integrate all those accelerations up, is zero. Or you could say the acceleration in this direction up here is completely compensated for by the acceleration in this direction down here. So we want to compare two velocities 
that are very close together. And then we can use a small angle approximation, and I'm going to call this little d theta. So this angle is changing by small angle d theta. And because the velocity is always perpendicular to the radius in circular motion, we can see that the difference between v naught and v final, the angle, is equal to d theta as well. And so I could write this out. Let's take this v naught and v final, or v1. How do we get to v1 from v naught? We have to add this delta v. Okay, and that's great because acceleration is in the same direction as delta v, and we know that the acceleration is inward here. And so delta v is inward. So we start with this velocity. We add that little change in velocity due to the force of gravity between the moon and the earth. And we end up with this final velocity. And this angle, d theta, is equal to this angle because the radius and the velocity are perpendicular to each other. Now we invoke something called a small angle approximation. What does that do for us? Well, if we compare this straight line here to this curved line, they're the same. And if you say they're not the same, well, I'd say just make d theta smaller. And you'll see they overlie each other when you get close enough together. Likewise, this curved line is the same as the straight line delta v. So now we need to find the change in velocity and the change in time. So in order to find the change in velocity, we make use of the fact that these two triangles are similar triangles. They're isosceles triangles with the center angles being congruent. And so we can make a relationship where dv is to v naught as dl is to r, the radius. And again, I make use of the fact that the little distance that I travel is almost the same as a straight line because of the small angle approximation. And so I can solve for dv. It's just v naught dl divided by r. And for dt, I just make note that velocity is equal to length divided by time, or in this case, dl divided by the amount of time it takes for my velocity to change from this velocity to this velocity. And I can solve for dt, it's equal to dl divided by v. Substituting that into the denominator, I get dl divided by v. The dl's cancel, and I end up with v squared divided by r. The square of the velocity divided by the radius of curvature. So now we have centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. And remember, when you see something executing uniform circular motion, it's undergoing centripetal acceleration. The force on it, I don't know the force. There's no such thing as centripetal force, but if you see something accelerating, you start thinking, ah, I know there must be a force. So for instance, for the moon, there is a force, the vector sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And you'd say, oh, that's the mass of the moon times the acceleration of the moon, which is centripetal acceleration. And the sum of the forces, oh, there's only one force, it's a force of gravity between the Earth and moon. This is called the satellite equation. Because it's a satellite, it has only one force acting on it, the force of gravity and it is equal to the mass of the satellite times the centripetal acceleration. And we could substitute in mass of the moon, mass of the earth over r squared times g is equal to the mass of the moon times, you could use v squared divided by r. And what you find, of course, is the mass of the moon cancels. So if we change the mass of the moon, it would still have the same orbit around the earth with the same speed. But if we change the distances, everything's going to change. How about if you just use force is equal to mg. Can you do that for the satellite equation? The question is, is the acceleration of gravity out here equal to g? And it's not, because we're very far away, and we remember the inverse square relationship of the force of gravity. You could use that where? You could use that for low Earth orbit, say LEO, low Earth orbit, where the object is just outside the atmosphere. The atmosphere is about 100 kilometers thick, and being that the Earth is 6,400 kilometers in radius, that extra 100 kilometers isn't the big deal. 
So for lower Earth orbit, you could use this formula. Otherwise, the acceleration of gravity depends on the distance of the planet, and you have to use this. But you can use the satellite equation for any situation where you see uniform circular motion. Like so, for instance, the car accelerating around in a circle because of friction. Now, you know there is gravity and a normal force, right? But this is the direction where the acceleration is. And then you just say, yeah, the force of friction is providing that acceleration. If you see something swinging overhead, now we've got something a little more complicated because it's not just the tension in the stream. Because if there was no gravity, this would be spinning like this. But it's spinning like this because there's tension in the stream. Then you just recognize it's a vector sum of the forces that is mass times acceleration. And we have something like this. We know the acceleration is inward because it's moving in a circle like this. And so the vector sum of the forces, the net force, must also be inward. And that's not hard. We've got two forces on this, the force of gravity and the tension in the stream. I make sure I add those two forces, tension and gravity, oh, to be in this direction. So this is tension, force of gravity. This is not the centripetal force, no. It's the sum of the forces. And that's equal to mass times acceleration. So we know what centripetal acceleration is. We know that accelerations come from forces. So when you see something accelerating, you can calculate its acceleration. By multiplying by mass, you can calculate what the vector sum of the forces have to be. But then you have to find those forces. Is it gravity? Is it the sum of gravity and tension? Is it friction? Is it a normal force? Enjoy.